Welcome to Freedom to Know Wellness, a disability advocacy platform to hold space and give a voice to those with complex medical and chronic pain conditions, female reproductive challenges and miscarriages, and address other disability-related topics. We also dive into how these medical conditions affect the individual's mental health and the challenges they face maneuvering through the Canadian medical, employment, and disability system. Our goal at Freedom to Know Wellness is to connect and bridge the gap between patients and the medical holistic community in which they seek treatment. I am your host, Michelle Samuels. Now please remember to subscribe to the Freedom to Know Wellness channel at FTK Wellness to catch all of our content and click the bell for notifications on new posts. If you enjoy our content, contributing financially to help the Freedom to Know Wellness production is greatly appreciated. Today's podcast concludes this series on uterine fibroids, but this is not the last on this topic for this season. Episode 4 covers the sensitive topic of female reproductive issues, including uterine fibroids, infertility, trying to conceive, we will use the abbreviation TTC, miscarriages, and hysterectomy. But today's interviewee, Michelle Kershaw, is not your traditional fibroids, TTC, infertility, miscarriage, and hysterectomy story, but one compounded with complex medical conditions and chronic pain, yet which ended in the birth of a beautiful miracle baby boy named Fletcher. Michelle has type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease, plus other medical conditions compounding. For anyone who has or knows someone with type 1 diabetes, then you know pregnancy can come with challenges such as high blood pressure, vision loss, and kidney disease. But complications like these are only scratching the surface of Michelle's experience. Michelle's story needs to be heard right off the bat to understand the full content of the journey that this woman and her partner endured to achieve their miracle baby before 30 weeks how they managed her many rare medical conditions, emergency surgeries, and an update on Michelle's current health post-hysterectomy. Listen to the end for more details on Little Fletcher. Please advise, the information provided in this episode is from the opinions of the interviewee and interviewer. For further medical advice, please contact your practitioner. Now, let's start the interview. Welcome to Freedom to Know Wellness. On today's podcast, I would like to introduce a woman that has gone through many trials in regards to female infertility, um, chronic um, pain disorders, autoimmune diseases, and just an amazing woman, a woman that I've known from my past, uh, from high school, which is amazing that we reconnected after all these years. And I would just like to welcome Michelle Kershaw to the Freedom to Know Wellness platform. Welcome, Michelle. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. And thank you for having me. Good. Great to have you. So tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, etc. Okay, so um, from originally from Toronto or Pickering, Ontario. Mm-hmm. And uh, in about 2012, um, I met my husband at a church function. And uh, I moved to Australia. So I live in Adelaide, Australia, um, specifically Mount Barker, which is uh, in the hills, a bit rural, out of the city, Uh, but live in Australia now. I'm an educator, was um, a teacher for 10 years in Ontario, and now another 10 years here. So I work for the Department for Education here in South Australia, and I have one son and one lovely husband and love being here. Yeah. Yeah. So what grade, what grade do you teach? Well, I don't, uh, previous to my current position, I was teaching upper primary. So here primary school ends at year seven at the time I was teaching it now ends at year six, but I taught year six and seven. And then I went into science, which is my degree. I have a degree in human kinetics, started teaching primary school science and then was hired as a project officer for the department. So I actually go out to um, public schools around the state, which we have, I think we have about 500 schools in the state. 
and I get sent to certain schools to upskill and build capacity within schools and portfolios in mathematics, in science, as well as in English. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So what in, in regards to um, your different conditions, what are your various diagnoses? Oh, okay. So, what, okay. So at seven years old, I was diagnosed with type one diabetes. And so I am now 44. So it's, it's been a long haul with that um, autoimmune disorder. And then for a long time, I struggled with asthma. But we are really very unsure as to what happened with it because I don't struggle with um, that any longer. Mm -hmm. I then developed uh, digestive issues. Mm -hmm. um, first, it was diagnosed as IBS and then realized it was actually gastroparesis in which my stomach does not actually fully digest food and it takes um, days for it to actually digest and move through my system which then affects my diabetes because i then don't feel like eating um yeah so those are the two but knowing my long-term unfortunate effects of diabetes has affected many things. So my joints, um, muscular pain, um, I am now partially blind uh, out, out the left eye. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's done a lot. <laughs> yes. Um, so the partially blindness is due to the diabetes. Is that correct? Uh, he, Oh gosh, partially. Um, in 2019, I was diagnosed with a disorder called neurovascularization, where these new blood vessels were were occurring. Um, we tried laser, we tried everything to fix it. That didn't work. Had to go in um, and do some other things. Everything was fine. I then developed glaucoma but it's not diabetic glaucoma okay um it was another type of an acute glaucoma in which my eye pressures went up to a 72 Jeez. um they then burnt holes in my eyes to relieve the pressure mm -hmm. that also didn't work unfortunately um, I now have a valve in my eye that relieves pressure every day. So my eye just waters. Okay. Okay. Every morning. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, you know what? You're standing strong nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. So in regards to uh, fertility, what type of Ooh. issues did you struggle with fertility? At what age did you start struggling with that? <laughs> Okay, so this was an interesting. I mm. think I started struggling with um, female issues uh, as young as 13. Mm -hmm. um, as I did not get a period, um, a menstrual cycle um, at the regular age, I then got one and then it stopped when I was 16. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh we kind of my family and i really didn't investigate as our gp said it was fairly normal um i was a dancer at the time so they just said oh it's you don't have enough um body fat mm -hmm. and so you don't need to you don't you're not going to produce one at about 19 um i decided myself from the i was working i went into a walk-in female clinic mm -hmm. um, at our pickering town center mm -hmm. and the doctor there did a pap smear and it was my first ever pap smear and they found a growth that doctor went home with me to tell my mom oh wow i was at the hospital pretty much the next day 
Sorry, what type of growth was, specifically are we speaking about? At the time, we didn't know what it okay. was. Okay. Um, but um, it was probably probably one of the scariest moments of my life um, because they couldn't do a biopsy at the time. I was meant to go to uni and start my second year of uni, mm -hmm. and I was turning twenty, and they just said you need to stay home we need mm -hmm. to get this out and at the time they said they i would be waking up either having children or not having children right mm -hmm. um i was able to wake up and i was fine i had a, a was a grapefruit size um fibroid mm -hmm. unfortunately it damaged my right side ovaries so mm -hmm. my ovary was removed um, so I was 19 and it was removed. They said everything would be fine. <laughs> no worries. Cause you have another ovary. Yes. Um, obviously I waited late, late in mm. life to, um, get married. I got married and then, um, we decided that we were going to have children. And at that time, I knew I was just having the one ovary. So then it was make sure you, my diabetes was set. Everything was set. Everything was good to go. Uh, we lost my first child. It was a miscarriage. And then I lost my second. Um, if you don't mind me, if you don't mind me asking, um, at yeah. what um, trimester was it? Uh, first trimester, but mm -hmm. it was 12 weeks. 12 oh, weeks gosh. for both of them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then... We decided to go to Repromed uh, is the um, is a private fertility clinic here. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we were going through that process, we realized that I was pregnant again with our third um, try. Mm -hmm. And I then went at 19 weeks. This is a bit hard to go over again at 19 weeks um they found that it was an ectopic pregnancy okay but i was too far along to do a dnc right so they gave me methotrexate which is a cancer drug yes yeah. yes i've heard of that medication mm -hmm. yeah to kill the fetus and have it pass through my body. So I had to bring down my levels. That would have been in April of 2018. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't able, I was, I was meant to come home to Canada to, for a visit. I could not travel um, because they said it's not safe for myself to travel in um, the state I was in. Mm -hmm, unfortunately mm -hmm. so i had to wait until july uh and then finally my levels were down i was healthy enough to travel we then said what do we do we went to another clinic another doctor um and approached him he did such thorough testing that we had never experienced before it was absolutely fabulous we then tried Clomid, which is another medication. With, then, the Clo with the Clomid, yep. how did your body react with it? I know that's a common medication that they use to help with infertility. Yeah, my body didn't react. Well, it, it was it was a very positive experience. Good. That's good. Um, after much testing, went through CAT scans, uh, all internals, everything, blood tests, mm -hmm. just to make sure everything was was well um and we got pregnant awesome yeah and we were able to give well everything was great and then it wasn't so we got pregnant um everything was great um to a certain point i then in i was yeah in may of 2017 was close to six months pregnant and I was feeling massive amounts of pain one night. I don't know why this pain, it was just really painful. And um, 
that was a Tuesday, got to the hospital. They said that they were going to be giving birth to this baby. And I said, sorry. And it was a very big rush. Then they said, because the hospital we were meant to give birth at, unfortunately, doesn't give birth to babies that early. And how many weeks was this again? 29. 29. Okay. Yeah. So then they said they were transferring me to another hospital. Mm -hmm. um, they transferred me to our local women's and children's um, hospital. Um, on the Tuesday, I was able to go home on the Thursday. No baby born. On the Friday, he was born. Okay. <laughs> All right. Wow. So he was born like at 30 weeks, in other words, or just yeah, about so, this, yeah, right? Or still in between? About, yeah. Yeah. Still in between. Wow. So, yeah. Just going back, um, you know, the fibroid that you had when you were 19, did you end yes. up um, in, incurring any other fibroids, um, ovarian cysts, anything uh, like that? Not that I knew of at the time. And so during your pregnancies, there were no fibroids that you were dealing with at the time either. Not that I knew. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and your doctors, well, I mean, your doctors, because this, this is now in Australia. So at that time Correct. they did testing to make sure there was no fibroids during your pregnancy, et cetera. Correct. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, so now you have your son. <laughs> yeah, we have our son. He's in the NICU. Okay. Um. Yeah we wondered what was going on mm -hmm. like why would he have been um birth at 29 weeks um so we ended up in the hospital for seven weeks so how long after you came you gave birth did you end up in the hospital you mean he was in the hospital so i'm a little confused the seven weeks was for you or for him uh him yes okay him. yeah so I unfortunately was there a bit longer than I should have been because of my diabetes, because giving birth is, is very traumatic and yes. it causes my blood sugar to drop. I dropped very badly um, to then get me back up to proper levels. Um, yeah, it was a bit of an emergency. Uh it was just all very rushed, very traumatic um, situation. Yes. So I was in hospital for 11 days and then mm -hmm. um, he was then in hospital for seven weeks. Okay. Okay. Yes. So I'll get him to up to find out mm -hmm. that I had a concealed abruption, um, a placental abruption, yes. a concealed one that I didn't realize was there. Um, and also to find out that I actually had another fibroid, the same size as my son. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was like giving birth to twins, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I then bled for a year mm. after giving birth to my son. So th sorry, just took a pin <laughs> in that for a second. Yes. So yes. you had um, a placenta abruption. Um, yes. um, this is the reason why he came so early. Correct. And the doctors, when they were doing the ultrasounds, they didn't see that prior. And it was a concealed one. Wow. Yeah. yeah. No, I understand that you said concealed. Is this, yeah. is this amazing yeah. um, to see that that can happen? <laughs> yeah. And so the fibroid was there, but they was, 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 was Fletcher hiding the fibroid? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Everything was hidden. Wow. And I okay. went through pregnancy just fine. Um, everything was great. Like my blood sugars were great. Everything, you know, you wanted to have this ideal pregnancy because mm -hmm. of your diabetes. And, you know, obviously medical professionals said, you know, you need to be really tight with your diabetes and you know possibly passing that through the womb and you know we we were in um a diabetic study as well prior to his birth okay um so you know we were going to be collecting stem cells everything 
that yeah that didn't go to plan because he came early and in such a rush so did he inherit yeah. the um the diet your diabetes um to this day no okay we he okay. we're still in the study every yes. six months he gets tested so how old is he now he is five Aww. yeah <laughs> wonderful wonderful i mean yeah. it's hard what you went through because that's 11 days and then he's in there for seven weeks and usually when children are in the NICU at least the parents are able to go back and forth but they had to be taking care of you at that time even for the 11 days Correct. that you're there wow yeah. so i'm gonna backtrack a bit um yep. for um many of us who have gone through miscarriages um the miscarriages is always devastation it's always devastating yeah very devastating yeah. for the mother and um, also very devastating for the husband or the partner. How did your, how did your husband manage this with you? Did it, was he very vocal about how it affected him or, you know, I, I obviously I know most times they're supporting their spouse or their partner, but how did, did he ever discuss how it, it affected him? Um, he didn't mm -hmm. actually. Um, my husband is, we are like complete opposites and uh, <laughs> he doesn't always fully communicate his feelings all the time. I truly did. And I was got it to this day. I, I choose not to talk about it really, or mm -hmm. um, because all of this, I believe really has affected um are the rest of our lives because we cannot have any more children okay and we're going to get to that further part of yeah. the story in a bit but yeah. um but you know it's funny um for a lot of the people who struggle with um infertility miscarriages and people don't realize that it doesn't matter at what point in your pregnancy <laughs> when you miscarry that is a loss that um that the mother feels even the mm -hmm. even the par even the partners they may not say it because they're oftentimes they're trying to make sure we're as women are okay or the partner's yeah. okay but that is a loss that it makes you always wonder of what could have been I don't Correct. know if that was your situation but I know for me that you know that is a situation what could have been and that's hard yeah I am um, the first two um the first one I actually didn't actually fully know I was pregnant anyway. Okay. Um, until a little bit later. So when I lost, I, I wasn't aware. So the second one, I was like, okay, I'm aware. This is huge. The ectopic. Yeah. It has taken a piece of me out. It actually took took part of me and yeah I think yeah. about it and because I felt like the process of passing the baby was so long that it wasn't a DNC a DNC okay it's gone yeah you're going and it's a yeah, because it's gone. this one took from April to July for my body to actually pass it. Um, and it, yeah, it took, it took, I, I think I've left part of myself there in July of 2018, <laughs> uh, or not even 2018, sorry, 2016. I think I, yeah, I'm still back there. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Wow. That's, um, I know they, um, the, uh, I'm just I'm trying to remember how to pronounce it properly, but the, um, the medication that you mentioned, uh, the, oh, it, yeah. is it the Mifepristone? I'm not too sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Methotrexate. Oh, methotrexate. Here. Oh, that's what they gave you the methotrexate. Trustate. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I know that one. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to go into details about, um, what that does, but that, is traumatic that oh, is very traumatic. much so and um, to the I point where i didn't you know michelle a, they gave me a pamphlet um 
to say what it does and not even what it does, but what my side effects would be. Mm -hmm. And um, I even, my skin burnt. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't realize that it would, but my skin actually, my, it was, it was, beginning to be great weather obviously we have good weather at that time of year and um and a friend of mine was getting married and we're on the way to and I was like why am I is that my skin and I smelt it burning because of the medication it it was correct I guess it was not without going into too much detail it's kind of works like chemo in that sense yes yeah 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 and and they don't actually give you any warning um when they give it to you so i had to have two doses and they come in biohazard suits into the room to inject it and they don't tell you this is what they're going to do i'm thinking oh it's just you know something in a syringe like any other nurse is going to come in but they are fully covered in a biohazard suit and i yeah i was taken aback by that because i'm like what do do you need all that for Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so yeah it was in it 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 is it, it will never leave me it'll never leave me i'm still part of me is still there That was 2016. Mm. So during that time, um, through your first, um, second and third miscarriage, uh, did the, um, along with, especially with this, the the third one, I shouldn't, I should say with any of them in general, but with the third one, did they provide you any uh, emotional support? Did they give you any pamphlets about contacting people to, okay. We, um, funny enough, we actually spoke to the hospital about this um, at at one point. And I said, and it was my second miscarriage and I was within, they actually do the DNC and then put you in a room Mm -hmm. with women who have just had babies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I said to them, this is not a good practice no this is not a good practice you can't do this to someone this is not a good practice you need to be a lot more sensitive um to what you're doing you cannot sit a female who's just lost a child in a room with women who have just given birth and they didn't even think about it and then when I had my third one, it was the same situation. I said, what are you, um, I then said to them, how often does this happen? And they say, a case like yours, we might see four to six women a year. For and the I third, you mean the third them, miscarriage? Yes, mm-hmm. My, mm-hmm. my ectopic. We maybe see four to six women a year. And I said, so what do you provide? those women Mm -hmm. and they said nothing I said well yet again a really poor practice that you anticipate that you will see four to six women with this condition with this situation and you have provided them nothing think about the mentality of those women think about what's going on in their head Think about what has actually happened to them that you as a health department are not providing. Yeah, so I I put in a complaint. I did. I put in a complaint. I don't know what has gone on thus far. Um, But yeah, I did. Did you also, um, and because it is a rare, um, it is a rare um, situation, but um, yeah. Did you seek any um, 
any um like say for example on social media any type of support through any type, any miscarriage um support groups that they provide on no, social media mm -hmm. I didn't because I then went to a psychologist myself good yeah good. yeah good. I sought my own my own help because again I was a professional and I knew that I needed help yes there was no way I could have gotten through that without speaking to somebody. Oh, yes. Because the process was they gave me the dose and then I had to get another dose. And then I had to go to the hospital every week and get blood tests to make sure the body was ridding, um, the baby was leaving my system. Okay. And so it was a reminder mm -hmm. every single week. Um, it was it, it felt like it never went away. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then in the end, morally, um, I knew I needed counseling because I actually thought I was a murderer. Yes, and I understand that. Um yeah. because because you feel like that and also faith. Correct. My yeah. faith was tested yes. massively yes um because i did i and 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 i um to this day say to my husband like I'm, i go back and i'm like so am i did i murder a baby or not is god going to forgive me and 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 my husband is is such a lovely person. He mm -hmm. goes, Michelle, the baby wouldn't have survived. Exactly. And then he said, unfortunately, if it continued, you, you wouldn't have survived. Exactly. Exactly. So he's like, I think God knows. Yes. Um, but you know, in those really low times, my brain still goes back there sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I'm glad that you sought um, help when they couldn't provide that for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had to. Yeah. No, uh, it, it, is, it is something that should be provided to all women, no matter what part of your miscarriage, to have some type of psychiatric or, or um, psychiatric help or um, speaking yes. to a psychologist, talk therapy, yeah. what have you. It's so important. Because a lot of times women just suffer in silence and we just said, okay, you know, I've miscarried, move on. Um, so I believe that that is something that is strongly needed. And that is a problem uh, for mis for women who have miscarried. You're put into the maternity ward and you're seeing all these things around you, you're seeing all these women who have given birth. There's all these things about these babies and you're just sitting there going, but I just lost mine. Correct. And I understand. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyways, let's, let's move on ahead. Uh, yeah. so you were mentioning that, um, after you, you had Fletcher, you discovered, um, the fibroids and the, um, the placenta, um, I want to say abbreviate, but it's not abbreviate. It's, um, you said oh, an abruption, the abruption. Thank an you. Abruption. Yes. Um, so what happened from there moving on? Um, so obviously, you know, obviously my focus was on, you know, after I got out of hospital, my focus then became, I'm going to see Fletcher. I'm going to see her every day, every mm -hmm. day was in the hospital. Unfortunately, I was unable to breastfeed as well, um, which again, based on the fact that he came, uh, when he came, it was just very difficult. I think it was a, my body stress. Um, so wasn't able to breastfeed, but you know, he came, he was so special. Um, he was our miracle. So we were very happy. I really, um, because the way he gave birth, um, I started bleeding and, but then after pregnancy that happened. So I was like, Oh, no big deal. But then when I was still bleeding, <laughs> when I gave birth in May, I was still bleeding in September mm, mm -hmm. and then ooh, December rolls around and I'm still bleeding. 
And I'm like, wow, I'm keeping the feminine napkin uh, company in business at this <laughs> point. Mm -hmm. I was like, what, what is happening? We went back to the doctor. Um, he then, we tried all of those, uh, um, Minerna, what was it? My, like those, those birth control, everything to try to stop the mm -hmm. blood. Yes. Um, you know, I put an implant on in, we, we tried, I think everything, mm -hmm. um, in the end, a year later, I had a hysterectomy. Um, and when we spoke to my OB, he, he really put it into perspective. He said, our son is a, an absolute miracle, Michelle. He said he could not, in our situation, guarantee um, another healthy birth. Right. He couldn't guarantee another baby's health. And he said, for sure, could not guarantee my health. And so we kind of put that into perspective and said, my husband looked at me and goes, I need you here to raise our son. Yes. Your um, health and your quality of life is what matters more. And you have your son. Exactly. And that's and, what my husband said to me right in the yeah. office. And I said, okay, had the hysterectomy a year later. Um, and he goes, but don't worry, you still have an ovary. That's you what I was go going surrogacy. to ask you. Okay. We had surrogacy, you had eggs, um, all of this type of stuff. So we've kept everything um, going. We, you know, thought about it. Um, and then this past year, 2022, I lost that ovary too, um, based on massive cyst that was found. And so I was then put into surgically induced menopause. Yeah. So my chances are now zilch. I've got nothing left. And yeah. so and that was just in, you know, October. Um, and I say to myself, okay, so I have nothing. And, and, and my thought is, so I have no estrogen being produced. Mm -hmm. What's making me a, a woman, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. again, another, another loss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm getting through, I'm getting through. Yeah. It, it, fibroids is and ovarian cysts are so common yeah and sorry I, it's, <laughs> your story is is hitting home um yeah. many women i found um from their 30s and 40s have had to have a complete hysterectomy like i find a lot of women for from our parents generation um yes. had to have hysterectomies and they removed everything right away yeah. Um, and I'm disclosing my mother's information, but she was 37 and mm. everything taken out. And I've seen that it's a history, like it's, it's changed now, at least where they have the partial yeah. hysterectomies, but yes. still it's usually that question of, okay, you're going for the hysterect partial, but you may end up losing everything. There's mm. always that, you know, that there's always that, that if, but then when you have lost everything, what support is there? for you and did nothing <laughs> you just answered my question nothing no. and that emotional support because no. uh, that was the thing I was going to ask you how did you feel physically how did you feel emotionally afterwards and it's been a year um, now after the hysterectomy yes yes after the complete oh, well, yeah th so this was in different stages. So, so yes. So let's go back. I had with a the, mm -hmm. So I had the uterine hysterectomy. So remember at 19, I had already lost an ovary. Yeah, ovary, exactly. So I, so this has all happened multiple different years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So 19 lost the ovary. And then in 2018, I lost my uterus. Yes, exactly. 
And how did you, sorry, um, just to stick a pin in it. How mm-hmm. did you feel after that? Did you still feel okay? You know, I've lost a uterus, but I feel okay. Did you feel physically off or? Oh, no, I felt great. I okay. felt good. I, I, you know, I was thinking to myself, that's okay because I still had option. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I still had an mm-hmm. option. Um, I wouldn't have to carry a baby. That's fine to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't one of those women who loved pregnancy mm-hmm. um, in any way. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, but I had options. Yeah. But just this past year, I was again having some digestive issues. Mm-hmm. And a doctor had sent me, my gastroenterologist sent me for a scan. And it was kind of just like this passing, oh, there's a cyst there that's about 14 centimeters. Huh? 14? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it just so happened my GP saw the results and goes, Michelle, I need you to go see this doctor. Um, and that was, I got those results one day. She had me see Paul Knight, like literally not even a week later. And he was like, yeah, Michelle, we got to go in. I need you to give me permission. If, you know, I'm going to take a look at this and if it is ruined your ovaries, your one ovary you've got to give me permission to remove it mm-hmm. and um i then said yeah just at that point i was so over over it um i said if you had to you have to he's like i'm going to try to avoid doing that at all costs at because all costs. Mm-hmm. you're 44 years old you shouldn't, you know, this will put you into menopause the mm-hmm. minute I do it. He's like, I am going to avoid this at all. He goes, when I got up and he sat, he held my hand. I remember this in the hospital. He came, he sat, he held my hand. He's such a beautiful man. And he said, Michelle, it was a mess in there. And he said, I had to, like, I had no other option. Mm-hmm. Um, yet again, ruined me. Um, and then I was fine after like the theme, like the feelings I was okay because I didn't really understand what surgical, um, induced menopause was because I, I wouldn't know. Yeah. Like I don't know menopause. And then all of a sudden about two weeks after surgery, menopause hit me. It hit me like I was flown into a brick wall. If you don't mind, <laughs> um, if you don't mind sharing with our listeners just um, some of the side effects of going into menopause. Uh, the, the heat, the, yeah. the hot flushes, mm-hmm. the the I didn't I don't sleep to this day I don't sleep um yeah it it, it's 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 my poor family Mm -hmm. (laughs) to the point you know I know we live in Australia I know it's hot but some days at nighttime it's fine Mm -hmm. degrees Mm -hmm. I have to have an air con on my Mm -hmm. poor family they are my poor five-year-old freezes but I can't, and then I'm fine, and then I'm too cold, but then it, the heat comes, and I'm awake pretty much. I go to sleep for about, I sleep at this point now for probably four hours a night, mm-hmm. and I work full time, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and yeah, I don't go to sleep. Did your, and- did your, um, your gynecologist uh, recommend any type of medications to, to help you at all through <laughs> this medical induced? Um... Yeah. So we tried um, patches. Yes. The patch, 
the patches because I was really trying very hard to not um, go to the pill mm -hmm. um, due to the uh, increased possibility of breast cancers, um, all of this stuff. The and patches, which pill um, were you speaking about exactly? Uh, I can't even remember the I'm, name. Of I'm it. trying to remember. I think the one that um, they used to use back in the days, they stopped using it because it was made from horses, um, sperm or something of this sort. I can't remember. But yes, I know. I'll, I'll look that up again to see which one it's called. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I really tried to avoid it. I was like, patches. Yeah, that's going to work. Mm -hmm. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. No, no. And I'm still to this day seeking... Um, other alternatives. I, I'm waiting to go see an integrated health specialist. Um, but currently I'm on one of the pills. It's not really working per se. Do you mind sharing um, with us which pill that is? Uh, no, I can't tell you because okay. I don't remember. The name. Okay. That's okay. I don't remember the name or the patches that um, you were taking. Do you remember any of those names? Oh, if you don't, that's fine. I can look it up. No, I don't. No, yeah. I don't. They all I know is they didn't work, and it was we were doing fifty, we we're doing seventy five, we we're doing a hundred, and I was like, "This is ridiculous." Mm -hmm. um, and then it was I have to change it every three days, and I'm just like, "No, nah, this is not going to work for the how I live my life. It's not going to work." Started taking the pill, this one pill. The pill was doing absolutely nothing. We've increased the amount. Um, it's a little bit helping and it's probably going to have to be doubled um, for it to actually do anything, which then still um, my doctor has said that I still need to go get a mammogram um, just to make sure everything yes. is okay. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. Right. Wow. Sorry. And I'm, I'm just... 44. Yeah, and I'm 44. 44. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I just... Yeah, it's really, it, it's taken, it's taken every day. It just takes me, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I just, I, I'm just, um, yeah, this is, um, it's, it, it is a lot. And, um, you mentioned yeah. that you were going to see, um, is this more like a naturopath? Sorry. You mentioned the name. I'm forgetting. So I've seen a naturopath, but here we have these integrated general practitioners. Yes. Yes. So they kind of mix both. Yes. A bit. And it um, stems from England. I know England, they have that in some parts yeah. of the Caribbean. So same thing with Australia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, um, I've seen a naturopath here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I wasn't about them. Um, so I feel like I need, I love my GP, but um, I, I need to try something different. And so I'm going to see one, not very, well, not very close to my house, but luckily our health food store has a naturopath that works there mm -hmm. and has suggested the integrated um, medical practitioner. So I'm going to go see them. Um, I find that um, having an integrated practitioner, you're getting a well-rounded, more holistic approach. So you're getting the best of both worlds. So Correct. I really am wishing you all the best um, with that. Thank oh, you. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, but, I'm looking um, forward to it actually very much. <laughs> so, but overall, um, with all that's gone on with um, the um, going into um, early menopause um, due to medically induced, um, how yes. has that has it affected your diabetes at all? Has it affected your um, gastro? I can't pronounce the name correctly. Gastroparesis. Gastroparesis. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Has it affected it? Uh, so. This is the other thing. So in 2021, to fix my gastroparesis, I had a doctor who told me he could fix it. Mm, okay. Well, I was like, perfect. This is going to help. And it's going to help my diabetes. What are we going to do? 
I'm going to have a gastric bypass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in 2021, I had a gastric bypass. Not to lose weight. Let me just clarify mm -hmm. that because I, I realize that people do it to, to lose weight. Mm -hmm. um, but he explained that this would assist with helping my digestive system and digesting of food. Um, has it helped? Okay. Uh, I would, I would say no, I would say no. Um, yeah, I would say no. That's all I can say. Okay. Okay. And <laughs> yeah. even when you were seeing the naturopath, I'm assuming you were addressing them regarding this condition as well. Yeah. And no benefits. None. Okay. Okay. None. Well, I'm yeah. really hoping that when you see the integrated practitioner that this will, they will be able to help you in that regard. Oh, uh, cause nobody else. Has. <laughs> you yeah. know, when it comes to complex medical conditions, yeah, that is a common, that's a common situation with many people that you're going to seek help. You're trying to get help in so many different ways. And it's either you get maybe a minuscule amount of help or no help at all, especially when it's a condition that is very rare an enigma and nobody knows the cause yeah you know i i love when people ask me about my diabetes and they're like oh does does it run in your family because my auntie has blah 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 mm -hmm. blah 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 and i said oh no that's type 2 diabetes mm -hmm. type 1 diabetes or juvenile diabetes isn't hereditary yes and, and then I said, there is nobody in my family who's got diabetes, not a single soul. And they're like, oh, so how did you get it? Because <laughs> my body decided to damage itself. That's why. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, you know, I can't really um, tell you why, but when you figure it out, you let me know, you know? Um, I so, always say it's been a blessing, you know, along with a curse, right? I, I, I feel like having diabetes for 30 plus years is been a very big blessing because I've remained to remained healthy because of it. Mm-hmm. I have to watch what I eat. I yes. have to exercise. I have to do all these things to maintain my diabetes. But with it comes everything else. Yeah. So with everything that's happened, how, I mean, we, we touched on how it's affected you with your mental health, with the miscarriages. Now that you're dealing with the menopause, how you're managing with the mental health. Are you still seeing, um, seeing someone as a psychologist or a psych, uh, psychiatrist to help you with all of this? No, no, not anymore. Um, even p since the surgery in regards to going to medical induced. Yeah, no, menopause? no, no, okay. no. So how have no. you been managing your mental health? What have you been doing? Like what oh, is been... doing things for myself? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Giving time to me, mm -hmm. taking care of me. So I um, wanted to take up karate, so I did. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, I do. You know, so the three of us, my son, myself, and my husband do karate. And uh, I go on Mondays all by myself. Yes. And I have graded higher than them and I absolutely love it. I think as a child, I've wanted to do martial arts, but mm -hmm. why not start at 44? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I do karate. Um, I do Pilates and I love it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's all reformer Pilates. Yes. I don't go to the gym anymore. I stopped going to the gym and lifting weights and doing all that stuff. I walk i do karate and i do pilates and it has just ah, 
yes. grounded yes. me into the earth. What made you decide to, I mean, Pilates is wonderful. Um, yeah. uh, it's yeah. something I've, I've, I've practiced for years, but what, um, what made you go in the trajectory of Pilates? I mean, you did karate because that's something you wanted oh. to do since you were a child, but what made you go into Pilates as part of your self-care? Um, I think it was, it was my dance background. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. I just remembered. Yes. So, you know, as dancers, that's what we yeah. trained in. So, you know, it. <laughs> yeah. Like I love the lengthening of yeah. my body. It it gives me, I love to point my toes. Mm. I love to lengthen my body in, in ways. And it's, and it's, it's really strengthened my core mm -hmm. and, and my being and I love it. Did you find that the Pilates also helped with any of your chronic pain, your joints? Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yes. if I'm not moving mm -hmm. um, and I haven't been to Pilates, uh, Pilates in a long time, I, um, I suffer. Mm -hmm. I do see a myotherapist. Sorry. A what therapist? A myotherapist. So is that like myofascial or what do you mean by myo? Yeah. Yes. That's so, right. Okay. Here in, not really in South Australia, but in another state, Victoria, there is a really big thing about myotherapy. And these people are trained um, in deep tissue massage along with physiotherapy. And you literally go into a room, uh, my myotherapist, if I say this hurts, by the end of my session, it's not hurting. So they're like massage therapists because because I know here they have massage therapists that deal with um, fascia. So yeah. I, is it basically it's the same thing, but I guess we call it slightly it's different. Fascia, yeah, mm -hmm. fascial release, um, yeah, tissue release. It's she's amazing, mm -hmm. and so I see um, our myotherapist. I see her at least once to twice a month. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so those are the things I do for me. And in Australia, um, yes. for, uh, for the type of therapy, I'm assuming that that's covered by your, um, by your insurance or no, no, no. Okay. Okay. No, we have a really different system here. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, not many things are covered. A lot of things are out of pocket. So when I say insurance, I'm not talking like OHIP. I'm speaking like ex um, extended insurance through work, et cetera. So maybe through your oh, husband. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, even that is not even covered. Okay. Extended health. <laughs> okay. 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 So I pay out of pocket. Yes. Yes. Which is fine. I mm -hmm. don't care because yeah. it's more important um, than anything. Yes. Yeah. It's about taking yeah. care of yourself and allowing right. yourself to enjoy life with your family with your beautiful young son. Oh my Correct. goodness. That's all that matters. I mean, and, and that's mm -hmm. what we said. My husband and I said, we aren't 20 years old mm -hmm. um, with a five-year-old. We're not 25 with a five-year-old. We're not 30 with a five-year-old. We are going to be 45 and 46 with a five-year-old. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we need to maintain our health, not only for us, but for him. Um, so he can see us participate and be active with him. And so mm -hmm. that's what we've chosen to do. Very good. Very good. I'm so yeah. glad that you're taking care of your health and doing yeah. all these things to be able to enjoy your family. And I know your faith has really played a huge part in regards to keeping going and et cetera. And keeping a smile on my face. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. always had a beautiful smile. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. You oh. did too, you know. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just want to thank you again for being on the Freedom to Know Wellness platform. This has been a very eye-opening um, interview nonetheless. And just, I thank you for being transparent, being vulnerable with what has happened with you and your family. And um, it's it's a wonderful story. And I really wish you the best of health, best of thank everything you. in life. Thank you. Oh my goodness. I appreciate I appreciate the opportunity to just 
tell people and to connect and and hopefully somebody finds some comfort in knowing that if they're in the same position that it's okay they'll get out yes exactly get out exactly and they'll get through yeah exactly yeah well thank you yeah thank you again so to our listeners for further information on ontario support or miscarriages and other female reproductive issues um, go to our website at freedom to know wellness at substack.com and subscribe to keep up to date with new posts and what's happening in the freedom to know wellness community so just to close i always say that reading information is one thing but hearing from a person's lived experience is another and that's what we do here at freedom to know wellness to our listeners who wanted more details about little fletcher his premature birth did come with some medical problems, but these problems haven't kept nor slowed Fletcher down. Here is his backstory. During Fletcher's time in the NICU, he had to be administered the drug fentanyl. This led to poor baby Fletcher enduring withdrawal symptoms like body twitching. On top of this, the doctors had to give Fletcher morphine to wean him off the fentanyl to reduce the harsh withdrawal effects. This care caused residual effects on Little Fletcher's body. At age two, Fletcher displayed high sensory problems as he would and does reject human touch. He has also been verified with ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder Level 2. But this miracle baby has reflected signs of giftedness and possibly savantism. By age three, he could do multiplications and use words like exasperated and photosynthesis. Even I struggle to say the word, but he's able to use it in its proper context without anyone explaining their definition or context to use. Fletcher is handling technology for grade level six and seven, but Michelle's husband, David, and Michelle are no academic slouches themselves. So little Fletcher isn't falling too far from the intellectual tree. Michelle, we thank you so much for sharing your story with us at Freedom to Know Wellness. And to our listeners, for further information on the impact of diabetes and pregnancy, uterine fibroids and hysterectomies, follow our blog at www.freedomtoknowwellness.substack.com and follow Freedom to Know Wellness podcast at FTK Wellness on our YouTube channel, Spotify, Anchor FM, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts, and follow us on social media on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you again and be well.